Hello everyone. My name is Mary Samuel. I work in the National Health and Social Care Professions Office. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third session of this webinar series hosted by the National HSCP Office in collaboration with the Institute of Leadership, ACSI. The theme for the series is HSCP Leadership in Practice During COVID-19. In today's session, we are delighted to showcase exemplary clinical leadership demonstrated by some of our HSCP colleagues who work in older persons, disabilities, and psychological services. Our distinguished guests in today's panel are Ms. Jackie Reed, Dr. Sharon Kenley, Ms. Adeline Quinn, and Dr. Damien Lowry. Ms. Jackie Reed is the national lead of the National HSCP Office. She's kindly agreed to facilitate the panel discussion. Thank you, Jackie. Sharon is a clinical specialist dietitian working in CHO8. She provides a clinical dietetic service across residential care sites for older persons in four Midland counties. She's the dietitian representative on the HSCP working group of the NCPOP. Since May 2020, Sharon has been seconded to HSC National Primary Care Strategy and Planning Office, providing support to national nutrition initiatives and policy development. Ms. Adeline Quinn is a speech and language therapist. She has provided speech and language therapy to children and adults who have speech, language, and communication needs and eating, drinking, and swallowing difficulties. Adeline is currently working as SLT manager in the multidisciplinary clinical team in Stewart's Care in Dublin. Dr. Damien Lowry is a chartered senior counseling psychologist in Matter University Hospital. He works with patients across multiple departments who have varying psychological needs. Areas of particular interest for Damien are pain management programs and supported self-management programs for those with a diagnosis of any chronic condition. Damien also offers stress control lecture series and is involved in research. Thank you panel for joining us today. Without further ado, I'm now handing over the session to Jackie. Thank you very much, Mary. I'm delighted to be here today to um, facilitate this conversation with our panelists um, and very much looking forward to the discussion. Um, I'm going to come to you first, Sharon, if I may. I know you're a clinical specialist dietitian in CHO8 and will have been involved with residential care and a lot of other important areas during this pandemic. Could I ask you, Sharon, to take us back to the beginning of the pandemic in March of this year and tell us a little bit about what work was like for you and what changed um, and what had to change in the health services as a result of COVID-19? Hi, Jackie. Um, yes, yeah, so as we know, back in March, um, it was a time of huge um, challenges and a lot of change that had to happen very quickly. Um, and so in March, uh, 16th of March, I got a call to go in to uh, train um, to work in testing and swabbing um, in the sites in the community setting. Um, and at that time, I would have been working as a clinical specialist for older persons um, across uh, four counties, providing a clinical dietetic service uh, to uh, nine sites, about 400 beds. Um, and I suppose on the 17th of March, I, I was redeployed immediately to the testing sites. And I suppose because we had had a substantial service to the sites over the last 10 years um, and with my predecessors, we had built up a multidisciplinary nutrition teams. Uh, we had policies in place. So I was able to put pull together very quickly a contingency plan for our sites uh, to guide our nursing colleagues um, when we wouldn't be on site ourselves. Um, and I was providing an over the phone service to the sites as well in between the days, um, not working in the testing sites um, because they were receiving, um, say, a lot of um, discharges from acute um, settings and also people on enteral tube feeding um, and similar. Um, so I suppose um, with the redeployment, um, we were we were well, I suppose we were well prepared in a way with all of our policy and things in place, but I was 
I was very conscious that other areas wouldn't have had the same level of dietetic service, wouldn't have had a clinical specialist post in place, um, wouldn't have any access. And I was very, very conscious that people would be um, maybe in worse circumstances than ourselves. Um, and speaking to colleagues, you know, we, we all were concerned that while nutrition might not be the, the, the top priority, um, to be seen to be top priority in the in the in the immediate term, we we knew that that this area definitely that we had expertise that we could help, and that we could put together something that might support people on the ground. I suppose what changed for me um, as well, unfortunately, um, about a month later, um, the beginning of April, I contracted COVID-19 myself um, and uh, I suppose I became very kind of um, acutely aware of the side effects of the disease and how it uh, affects nutritional status. Um, and I suppose I had the kind of classic uh, COVID myself, um, high temperatures, cough, um, uh, loss of appetite, loss, uh, complete loss of taste and smell for six weeks. Um, I was very lucky like to only have mild or moderate disease and my husband and um, subsequently as well um, was COVID positive and um, but I suppose I was very I was thinking to myself how would an older person cope with this how would they someone with dementia communicate their loss of taste and smell and um, you know if, if I lose five or six pounds you know it's it's not it's not going to have a long-term effect but for somebody that's on the edge of you know developing a pressure sore or um is already frail um it this is going to have a, a a huge effect for their care and and um so i suppose all those things kind of came together um at the one time at the start of when we d d developed this resource thank you sharon for sharing that so clearly you are driven both by your professional expertise and knowledge and and um, very much informed by your your personal experience and I'm glad that you're all doing well after that um could you could you tell us a little bit then about a bit more about what the thinking was behind the initiative and you know why you felt it was so important and the kind of resource that you and your your colleagues were able to put together yeah thanks Jackie. so i suppose what we felt that um we were like we were coming back and we were looking at these webinars at night time and all the papers and evidence that was coming through um as i'm sure other colleagues would have been from china italy spain and really shown the the really negative effects um that covid was having particularly in the old persons particularly in residential care settings and um we felt it was really important that we we try and recommend a very proactive nutritional approach um and i suppose a treat without delay um type of approach because there's really just a very very small window before somebody's nutritional decline um, will 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 translate into increased frailty, increased risk of falls, um, increased um, development of pressure ulcers. Um, so what we wanted to do was put together something that would um, you know reflect a kind of a an active treatment plan, but that would be simple for relatively simple for staff to implement without um, needing further support. So we we came up with kind of five key actions that nursing colleagues could take um, without kind of needing, um, you know, any any further uh, clinical decision making and also kind of an algorithm of care that they could follow. Um, and I suppose it, it's not normal routine care, so not to not to replace the normal procedures and policies that they have in place or, or that this could replace the, the expertise that they needed from other healthcare professionals, but just something to tide them through, I suppose, the as it was being called at the time, the war times, something to guide their practice. Um, we were conscious that say that there would be a lot of staff maybe coming into residential care settings to work who maybe never worked there before. And they would need, they wouldn't have time to take out books of 30 or 40 pages of policies. They need something, um, you know, literally in eight to 10 pages, the most important key points that you need to know to support these residents during these times to make sure that they don't um, have nutritional decline. So I suppose our, our thinking behind the pack is that we would have to cover something in terms of a, a very brief care algorithm that could be literally stuck on the wall, a one pager. We would have one menu, a snack list. Um, we would have uh, drinks options. We would have advice around things like refeeding syndrome, which is, you know, it's an unusual risk, but it could uh, could happen in this time. Um, advice around palliative care and uh, particularly at the time, which was um, an, a huge area of um, interest in the media and in healthcare vitamin D. So just to make a simple recognition to the sites around those things. Um, so we, we pulled together the resource over two weeks 
and um, it was very much like kind of get the get the dream team together. So um, I suppose, you know, we, we knew that there's only a small number of people that we could pull together um, as people were redeployed, but say we had Margaret O'Neill, the national dietitian lead and um, the the chair of the older persons interest group of the INDI, which is the professional body. Um, we had Anne-Marie Bennett, who had won the Excellence Award for the HSE for catering projects in St. Mary's, and they had a huge amount of resources that were ready to go there and we could share those. Um, so, you know, we 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 also, you know, um, pulled together um, things that were already existing, you know, and, and that could be shared with others um, in, in, in the format of this pack. Thanks, Sharon. That sounds like a phenomenal piece of work and, and an incredibly important piece of work that you pulled together in a short period of time. And clearly that, um, that uh, the, as you described, the dream team that you had together and yeah. maybe you could tell us a little bit about hap what happened after you developed the resource. Um, well, I suppose one of the key enablers is that I suppose I would build up a network of people that I would communicate with and then all those people who got involved they brought their networks on board. So I suppose, like if you take, um, obviously Margaret O'Neill as the National Dietetic Lead, she was able to directly communicate with Siobhan Kennelly, the National Clinical Lead for Older Persons, David Hanlon, the National GP Clinical Lead. And she said, look, we I, we can get a working group together. We can we can do this for you in the next two weeks. Um, and they said, yeah, look, we're hearing this back from the ground. Um, staff are concerned about this. It's coming back from the nursing homes as an area of concern, nutritional care. Please, can you, you know, can you do something? And um, then Deirdre Lang, um, the nursing clinical lead, she had set up a network with um, all the directors of nursing um, and a WhatsApp group across, I think, um, four or five hundred people. So um, that was a direct link out to all of those people. Um, to our professional body, we would have linked with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. So we linked with them immediately to get the correct vitamin D information to be able to disseminate that out um, very quickly. Um, I had been working with um, developing an education program for GPs. So I went to ICGP and it turns out they have an older persons interest group um, led by uh, Dr. Lucinda Dockery and she was very helpful. Um, everybody was um, very supportive and willing to kind of disseminate out um, information that they, from a trusted source to their network. So that was a huge enabler for it. Um, the second piece, I suppose, was that we already had a kind of a digital hub for resources in place. So it was something that we developed under primary care a couple of years ago, um, www.hb forward slash nutrition supports. And that meant that we had already worked with HC Communications before and um, Sandra Hogan from HC Communications came on board and she helped us to um, you know, uh, kind of design, I suppose, the, the, a better looking resource that would be easy to read and user friendly, and and that would and she put it up on the on the web pages for us um, as well. And um, so having that kind of a, a digital a place where everybody could be just sent a link to it, so that um you know that would help to disseminate the work as well. Um, and as I say, like all the clinical leads were really accessible during that time and really uh, interested to hear everybody's ideas and what um. What if anyone thought they had anything that could help? They were open and willing to to listen to that, and and that was really really helpful as well. Thanks, Sharon. And how did you get your final product out out into the system into people's hands? As I say, we used networks that I suppose everybody had. So I suppose the once the clinical leads um endorse it so it, it literally as I say after two weeks it was done and it went up for a clinical sign off then they were able to put that out to the to the doctors to the nurses via their networks and we were also able to do a webinar via the All Ireland um, Palliative Care um, group and they facilitated that and we were able to put the webinar up then and they they hosted it on their website and a lot of um, nursing directors of nursing in the nursing homes were tuning into that at that time um, we we were we were able to send it out via as I say um, the normal HC communication channels um, and we were able to we had our as I say our professional body networks um, and then the local networks within the HC for community dietitians and residential care sites it went out to the heads of service um, and down through their channels as well and heads of discipline so um, it did it did reach the ground and when I saw people starting to tweet sections of it saying this is helpful look at this you know I said this is that has worked then if if even a couple of people found it helpful you know that sounds excellent, Sharon. And finally, maybe just um, at this stage now, reflecting back on that, wh what would you say was your key learning um, from from all of that work? Um, I think reflecting back on it, I think at the very beginning, it was very kind of it was demoralising to feel that maybe you wanted to help, but you thought you were going to help 
within your professional expertise, but actually, you know, being redeployed, that was a completely different experience. But still, you know, we knew that we had knowledge and experience and we knew we had expertise that could help. And, you know, we had a little bit of time in between the other work that we were doing to pull this together. Everybody did. And I suppose it's that I said it before, it's kind of like your 15 percent what you have autonomy over, what you can do. If you really believe it's important, stick with that and put together something. And even if it helps a few people, it's it's worthwhile doing. Um, so I think that that that's kind of very empowering as well. And even when, you know, when I was at home, when I was self isolating, I, I kept working on it at that time because I really believed that it was really important just to do something to try and support our colleagues in, in the nursing homes who were working so hard and, and doing such a brilliant job at the time under, under extremely um, difficult circumstances. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, I, I love your I love your um, message about the 15 percent and uh, that that personal dedication shines through. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Now I'm going to come to Adeline Quinn. Um, Adeline is an SLT manager in Stewart's Care. Um, and I'd like to, to maybe ask you, first of all, um, Adeline, I, I'm not I'm not sure that everybody might might be aware of the services at Stewart's Care. And I think it might be useful if you kind of give us a little a little brief overview of that before we start. Hi, Jackie. Yes, uh, definitely. I suppose Stewart's Care is a service that's based up in uh, Palmerstown in Dublin, and it's a voluntary organisation that supports children and adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, so it's a lifelong service. Um, and it has a range of services here um, in, across CHO7 as well. So there's a special school, a preschool. We also provide early intervention services. And uh, there's also then 25 residential homes on site here in Palmerstown, uh, independent and supported living and 30 community homes across local communities here in and around Palmerstown and Lucan. Um, and I suppose as well as that, we would have quite a lot of day services and supported employment services here too. Um, so I'm part of the multidisciplinary clinic and the clinic would consist of uh, dietetics, speech and language therapists, occupational therapy, psychology, um, physiotherapy and positive behaviour support, social work and safeguarding to name a few. So we're quite a large multidisciplinary team. Um, and again, we're based and we work across all those services. So we provide clinical supports to children and adults here with intellectual disabilities. Um, and I suppose kind of, you know, one of the main things in working in a disability service is that we would never work in isolation um, in the clinic. So we, we work very, very closely with the frontline staff um, that work in the residential and community homes and day services. So nursing and care staff are essential to us to be able to do and follow through with our clinical duties, but also most importantly, the service user is always the centre of the service that we provide here in Stewart's Care. Um, so families are extremely important. And again, other external agencies or teachers in SNA. So we're constantly working alongside others um, here in the clinic. We're, we're part of one service um, in Stewart's Care. Thank you, Adeline. So a, a very broad service uh, supporting a, a very broad range of people um, um, there. And um, I'm thinking COVID must have had quite an impact um, on, on that service and how you were able to support those people. Could you tell us a little bit about the challenges that COVID posed, posed for you in your service? Um, definitely. So I suppose like many other disability services across Ireland, we were in completely uncharted territory. So um, many of and most of the services that we would work within were suspended or paused or closed. So the school and the preschool um, day services and, and also our early intervention services that would be clinic based. So they were all suspended at that time. Um, and also, um, I suppose the, the residential and the community homes remained open. So they were open, but obviously with very stringent infection prevention control measures in place. Um, and, I, you know, for us as clinicians as well and uh, you know this is something i suppose that we all felt at that time was you know when the directive came to work from home that's exactly what we did and and worked from home but it was a completely different way of us working so we would always be on site or in a home or in the school or in the clinic so it was completely changed i suppose our traditional idea of what we did as clinicians um and again, you know, similar to Sharon as well, we were asked to be redeployed to areas as required. So there was 
a range of us that um, were requested to do the COVID-19 swabbing and also our administrative teams here provided contact tracing support as well. Um, and I, again, just to highlight, I suppose, working in a disability service, the clinic will never exist on its own. Um, and there were teams and departments across the service um, that were experiencing those challenges. So you know, we were very fortunate to have a very strong COVID nursing response team. We have GPs on site and we have infection prevention control as well. Um, and frontline nursing and social care and at, you know without their support the clinic wouldn't have been able to function as as it did through that initial lockdown period so again we were very fortunate to have that support system in place. And as you reflect back Adeline what were some of the highs and lows um, from, from that period as you remember them? Um, I suppose in terms of like you know I, you know with a low first you know with, with working in stewards there's a very strong sense of community um so you you're constantly working in environments that are full of activity and friendship and life and that would hold a lot of mem memories you know both good and bad for us when we're working as clinicians and then coming in and they were suddenly silent and closed it was just quite an unusual working atmosphere to be in um and again like many of our health and social care professional colleagues, you know, we um, we did lose people to COVID-19 and and that for us was very challenging as well. Um, but I suppose, you know, one of the highs was that you, the, the positive parts of this was that we continued to get through it together as a team um, and that, you know, it was the focus on the service users that grounded us. So maintaining our clinical supports to service users um, and that, again, I suppose, you know, did facilitate our resilience in many ways was by having them as our focus throughout all of this is that we were, you know, aiming to to keep our clinical services open as much as we possibly could um, so that they were at the centre of the service still. Um, and I, I think something that we were you know, just talking about recently here as well is that the availability of CPD, I mean, we've never had as much access uh, to CPD opportunities as we do at the moment. I mean, there are constantly webinars and online learning. So, you know, being able to develop expertise and skills in certain areas, I mean, that's definitely been a positive as a health and social care professional is, is the opportunity to do that CPD now as well. Fantastic. And thank you for sharing those those insights. It's really very, very interesting to get that that glimpse into what what things were like in, in your in your particular kind of service. Um, can you tell us a little bit about so, you know, where are the services now as as we're, you know, several months months in? Um, what, what are services like at the moment and how have you adapted? Yeah, so, um, you know, our services kind of changed from the get go in terms of being able to maintain clinical services open. And again, we're not in acute setting. So this was one of our key priorities for the the departments working here um, was to upskill in PPE. This is that was not part of our daily working life. So, um, you know, upskilling our staff in PP has, you know, allowed us to continue working within the residential and the community homes and um, so that we can still get in and see people. So say in particular occupational therapy or physiotherapy, when someone is discharged from hospital, they're able to get on site, put on down their PPE and get in and ensure that there's, you know, the rehabilitation needs for the person are met within that environment. Um, and also then that, that blending of services. So, you know, looking at remote services and telehealth. So definitely a lot of the clinical uh, areas at the moment are providing a wide range of telehealth services. And um, so, for example, we, we would do speech and language therapy assessments and part of assessments through telehealth with families or with teachers um, and be able to offer and continue to offer training and specific training modules through telehealth as well. So it really has opened up a lot of possibilities for us here in Stewart's. Um, and I think probably, you know, looking forward from a reflective viewpoint, we may not know all of the changes um, and the impact that they're going to have. But I suppose, you know, from an, an initial get go, the, um, you know, people were pushed into action and, and did so quite quickly. Um, and there were helplines set up for fam families and service users through social work, psychology, um, and safeguarding as well, just to make sure that, that we were connecting with families and service users and that they knew we were there and available to support them if they needed. Um, 
and you know very similar to other organizations it was that balance as well of, of us you know participating in the COVID-19 swabbing and contact tracing and trying to balance then our clinical demands and needs in that area as well um, but I, I would definitely feel you know we're very fortunate that we have heads of departments and we have a clinical director here of clinical services so uh, they've been a great support in in getting our disposals ready for what the future might look like for clinical services. Thank you, Adeline, for for for, for sharing um, that update and where where you're at now. And as you reflect on those those challenges and difficult times and and huge period of change you you've you've been through and you've described there, what what would you say is your kind of key learning or your key takeaways on, on a personal level from from all of that? Um, definitely one of the key learning things was that the ability of our health and social care professionals here on site and stewards to step up to that request of redeployment. Um, and basically, I suppose they just did what was needed. And I was part of that swabbing team myself as well. Um, and I think on, you know, looking back, we just we we just took the position and, and we followed through what was needed of us, knowing that we still wanted to maintain our clinical services as well. And I think dealing with change at a very fast rate and trying to be innovative. So looking at how we delivered clinical services, whether it be we don our PPE and we go in or we provide telehealth or in some situations, you know, meet in people's gardens to provide support. Um, so we, you know, I suppose like that one of the it's dealing with that change at such a fast rate, making sure you are reducing the risk of transmission. Um, and then by maximizing what we do as well. So finding other ways to do things. Um, I think also from a relationship and a connection point of view, it's you know our connection with service users, their families, key workers, and how essential that is to the job that we do as health and social care professionals. Um, and during that period that we didn't lose sight of the service users, that we adapted our service to meet their needs as much as we possibly could. Um, but yeah, so they were some of the learning. And again, I would hope maybe more opportunities for reflection on the change, the changes that have happened in the future as well. Thank you so much, Adeline, for sharing that. I think very, very interesting insights and, and reflections with us. Thank you so much. Now I'm, go I'm delighted to come to Damien, Dr. Damien Lowry, Senior Counselling Psychologist at the Matter Hospital. Um, and I, I think, Damien, you're going to talk to us a little bit more about some work that was maybe more focused around the um, the staff side of things. So maybe maybe you could you tell us a little bit about the most the significant achievement from your point of view during um, COVID or since COVID. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Um, well, it's it's fair to say that from March until June, July, even you know daily life for our department, the psychology department, it was transformed enormously. Um, and as a psychologist in the Matter Hospital, most of what I had been doing up to that point COVID arrived was, you know, involvement in groups, talks, workshops, uh, individual work with patients, etc. And that all had come to an abrupt end. So we were in a, a, almost a, a state of suspended animation in some ways. So and we found that to be a bit of a vacuum. But in a way, this was the catalyst to focus the mind on something different, something that perhaps was going to make a meaningful contribution to hospital life. Uh, or indeed the wider healthcare setting itself. And um, it was quite apparent, and, and it was topical even at the time, that the psychological well-being of healthcare staff was being tested over and above the norms of regular health service delivery. Uh, and, and some of that was attributable to the pandemic and how much fear it was, I guess, provoking in people, etc. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty circulating, that's for sure. Um, so I took an existing idea that I had, which was a study really to study or evaluate the burnout amongst Matter Hospital staff and um, obviously where I work and, and I repurposed it into a survey that was seeking to evaluate the psychological functioning of healthcare staff um, across a number of different hospitals, particularly during this time of COVID. So, and this was partly the point, COVID in many ways created the opportunity for colleagues to work together uh, and in this case, psychology colleagues. So when we might not otherwise have been inclined to do so, we kind of tend to work in our own little silos, as it were. Uh, and it, it cr created the conditions in a way that brought us together. Uh, it prompted us to engage with each other uh, and ultimately co collaboratively support and endeavour to study uh, and hopefully help our healthcare colleagues in a more meaningful way going forward. 
thanks, Damien. And can, can you, you mentioned the study that you undertook. Can you tell us a little bit about why that study is important? What's, what's important? To, why, what's, why is it important to do such a study? Um, well, for a start, I guess the health and well-being physical and indeed mental of, of staff is, is important, isn't it? <laughs> it's, and some would argue it's vital. Um, you can't pour from an empty cup and all of those sayings that kind of go along with that. So, you know, and, and, and I guess just focusing on the study itself, it'll be one of the first, if not the first study of its kind on, on an Irish domestic sample. There's a good bit of research on healthcare staff, typically doctors, medical personnel, and sometimes nursing staff too. Um, and, and their psychological well-being. And it's generally, you know, UK populations or samples and likewise US samples. And um, there isn't a huge amount, if any, um, studies in the domestic Irish context looking at that issue. Um, and it's also distinct from the existing literature in that we're looking to evaluate all healthcare professionals across five Dublin adult hospitals. Um, most studies, as I said, look at selected disciplines. And uh, we want to capture the psychological functioning of HSCPs or health and social care professionals who make up a quarter of the health service uh, workforce and indeed other disciplines, you know, like I, I feel at times they're the forgotten bunch, you know, the porters, catering staff, admin, um, who are Trojan workhorses in, in, in certainly the clinics that I'm party to, uh, IT personnel, estates people who are very, very active in the matter at the moment. They're probably, you know, being pushed to the point of it being the brink because uh, there's a lot of transformative development and capital infrastructure going in. So these guys are like literally working around the clock, maintenance staff, et cetera, to kind of make these clinics kind of happen and get built. Um, and, and they're often the ones on the front line of service delivery, uh, even if they're not always the ones getting the claps on the doorsteps, you know, where the candles lit for them and all of that. Um, and and we, they all, all these disciplines deserve the plaudits, you know, so I, I felt that was another important um, aspect to our study to, to, to be inclusive in that in that regard. And finally, I guess we're, we're seeking to track psychological functioning of staff over time. And most studies are cross-sectional. And what that really means is they kind of take a measure of how well people are doing or not so well at a particular point in time. And we've obviously done that. So just this September gone, we the study went live and we had it open for the entire month. And we have a lot of data to, to, to sift through and make sense of. But we're, we're also going to reopen the data collection window in February and again next September. And, and even though not everyone who did it in September just gone will do it again in February or next September, we're hopeful that a, a sizable kind of cohort of individuals will do it um, on two or three even occasions. And that'll allow us to track people longitudinally, so over time. And, and, and in that way, it just allows us the opportunity to identify factors that actually uh, cause or are, are significant contributors to uh, some of the psychological problems that we might be seeing. Thanks, Damien. So um, that's a great outline about the study. Can you tell us what you hope is going to be accomplished then by, the, by this study? Yeah, sure. I, I've possibly kind of touched on it maybe already, but we do hope it'll be a seminal study. You know, that's a big kind of promise and uh, I, I, we hope to deliver. Um, but that it, it will, you know, be a bit of a landmark study, uh, even if there are, and I, I'm aware of other groups in the West and in the Southwest who are sort of looking similarly at this, this issue. But, you know, just by virtue of population distribution, um, Dublin is where one in four people on the island tend to live. And I think across the five sites where we're capturing data from 50%, give or take, uh, of the COVID cases were managed on those sites, you know, so it, it, it's sort of standalone in its own respect. And we really hope to identify factors uh, associated with negative mental health, health outcomes uh, amongst healthcare workers um, across the three different study time points. Um, and, and I know that tends to be the main focus, doesn't it? You know, we, we look to the negative, we, we want to see what the problems are. Um, but but I, I, I would also like to think, um, and I am hopeful that we'll also focus to some extent on factors that are associated with positive mental health outcomes amongst healthcare workers. And there's a lot of talk about resilience and it's a bit of a buzzword. And I do, I am an advocate for re resilience building and it is possible, I'm not trying to, but, but we, we measured resilience um, using a fairly robust uh, questionnaire and early data suggests that it isn't 
in any way associated with the problem. So you'd imagine people high on resilience aren't going to be high on stress, but they actually are, you know, and vice versa. So it's 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 an interesting point to tease out, shed further light on, because what we might talk about or what, what we might mean by resilience might actually look quite different to what we're trying to do about it. And I would love to, you know, make a meaningful contribution in that in that respect. Uh, finally, uh, you know, we are hopeful that we'll disseminate um, the findings by way of peer reviewed journal publications, conference talks, I'm attending a conference tomorrow and Friday virtually, hopefully come, you know, what next year we'll be back to perhaps being in person, but also perhaps more importantly, disseminating this information on site across these hospitals, you know, because it's the executive tier of these hospitals and perhaps even further afield in the upper echelons of the HSC that need to know this information so that they can hopefully act upon it if there's enough of a rationale to do so. And um, so, so that's really what I hope will come from all of this. I'm not asking for much. Thank you very much, Damien. That's been really interesting. And thank you again to Sharon and Adeline, both of you, for sharing your, your insights and, and your journeys and the examples of particular work you've done over this time. I'm now very pleased to hand back to Mary Samuel. To summarise, I would like to highlight the key points discussed by each of our panel members that align with leadership skills, specifically demonstrating leadership being put to practice. I'm going to start with Sharon. As I was listening to her, I was drawn towards how our own experience of the symptoms of COVID-19 placed her in a unique position to reflect on it, which then helped her to develop an empathetic response and to lead in a compassionate way. Amidst her coping with her own recovery, she found this extra capacity and had the drive to lead and contribute to this project. Adeline's sharing revealed how things changed during COVID-19. The change from busy, buzzing, full of life work environment to a silent, closed place. HSCPs working from home, all these making them to reflect on the power of working alongside and in collaboration with service users and other team members. Adeline also reflected on the loss of service users to COVID-19 and the impact it had on their staff, their service. To me, this highlighted an important characteristic we HSCPs have, the connections we make with our patients, service users, their families, and how important it is for us not to lose it. Damien's sharing in a nutshell depicts the importance of future-proofing the importance of data research to complement clinical work and the need for such information to make policy changes. Though not called to be part of frontline services, the vacuum that was created by the temporary cessation of services led them to respond in a meaningful way. Reaching out to other professionals, looking at the feasibility of conducting a longitudinal study within Irish settings and making it a reality is for sure a contribution that requires commitment and perseverance to see it through. Thank you once again, Jackie, Sharon, Damien and Adeline. Our sincere thanks to Ms. Tina Joyce from RCSI for her expert advice, help and support to make this webinar a reality. Our thanks to Suzanne and Miriam from RCSI operational and technical teams respectively. Please refer to the slide for our contact details. We are looking forward to meeting you in our next webinar. Thank you.